than saved by correction. Well, I don't have statistics, but I think there's a lot of truth to that. Menon McClellan said, nobody wants constructive criticism. It's all most of us can do is to put up with constructive praise. There's an old adage that most of us would rather be ruined by praise than helped by criticism because we just don't naturally like to be corrected. When we're young, we don't like it. When we're teens, we don't like it. When we get older, we don't like it. We avoid it. But when we refuse to be corrected, we forfeit one of life's greatest opportunities for growth. If you have even one friend who loves you enough to correct you, then you have a treasure that you should be ultimately grateful for. It is to be hoped that your friend will be both wise and gentle in their correction, but if not, even then, correction is valuable. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses of an enemy, says Solomon to us. Correction, of course, doesn't have to come from others. It can come even from ourselves. And in fact, one of the distinctive marks of wisdom is the willingness to learn from the mistakes that we see others making without necessarily having to learn the hard way through personal experience. None of us has anything more than an imperfect understanding of anything that we deal with, and none of us is error-free in anything that we do, or at least for any great length of time. Being wrong at times is a part of the human condition. I suffer from it, you suffer from it. The issue is not the mistakes, the issue will be how we handle those mistakes in ourselves, and in one another. Most people say that they like to make progress, they like to grow, but in the real world there is simply no way to make progress and growth without honest feedback. In the absence of valid information about our situation, and that's what correction should amount to, we have no way of knowing what to do to improve ourselves. Tyron Edwards put it, he that never changes his opinion never corrects his mistakes, will never be wiser tomorrow than he is today. You're just stuck. Of all our human endowments, correctability is one of the greatest that God allows us to participate in. But it's also one of the hardest, isn't it? Sometimes it requires the swallowing of our pride but it is really the only open door to all the better things that God has in store for us. Wise men do not consider that making no mistakes is a blessing. They believe rather that the great virtue of man lies in his ability not to make no mistakes, but to correct his mistakes and continually make himself a newer and better man. And that's our subject. Chastening is not joyful for anybody. Some of you have had the great pleasure of having graces at some point in your life. I obviously say that a little bit with my tongue in cheek, which is no pun intended for graces. But I've not had anybody tell me that that's a joyous experience wires placed in your mouth, a dentist who gets paid for tightening them and inflicting pain, and then you have to pay them for it. But their purpose is clear. It's to, it's to correct that which needs correcting. Their purpose is to straighten that which is not aligned properly so that you can have the beautiful smile and the good bite and chew in your older years. It's inconvenient. They're restrictive. They'll tell you there's some foods you shouldn't eat. Gooey, sticky, caramels. It's a no-no when you have braces. 
but we do it because they're necessary. Well, God is also interested and concerned when His children are growing out of alignment, not straight in their walk. And when that occurs, action is needed. As with braces, sometimes tightening is needed. The Bible portrays us at least the way God wants us to be, as caring Christians. But it also portrays caring Christians are always also correctable and sometimes correcting Christians. God established the family of faith and says one of the proofs that you and I love one another is our willingness to be corrected and to correct one another when we become crooked. One of the great proofs of our love. In 2 Samuel, God came to a prophet, Nathan, and he said, You go talk to King David. Now, we're not told much about what flew through Nathan's mind. Do you think he maybe rehearsed that conversation with David a time or two? He fretted a little bit about it? He stewed a little bit about it? If God had come to you or me and said, I want you to talk to King David, would King David have ever gotten talked to? Or would he have been lost in his unrepentant sin? Chasing is not joyful for anyone. In Hebrews chapter 12, we're told, whom God loves, he chases. Growing up, our parents sometimes would say, well, I know this hurts me worse than you. And if you were like me, you wanted to say, let's trade. (laughs) But you understand that a little better as you get a little older. But we are to be a one another people. And when it falls to you and I to confront or the term maybe today is to intervene or intervention. You know, we would be hard-pressed to find people lining up for that job. And many times the effort is not pleasant, nor is the outcome what you maybe had hoped for. But the fact that we are to walk by faith in no way implies that we are unaccountable. The New Testament is not a live and let live, or a whatever, or let's leave each other alone. No, the New Testament is a one another gospel. I'm accountable to you, and you are accountable to me. Nobody loved more than Jesus. And yet Jesus never turned a blind eye or swept under the rug when one of his disciples headed in the wrong direction. He confronted it. Why? because he loves. I was staying in a home within the last year and holding a meeting at a place and the family I was staying with usually was in attendance. That night I noticed they weren't in attendance and I wasn't upset by that other than I was hoping they were all well. When I got back to where I was staying, the family, some of the members came in and they had been called to an intervention. And you could see on their faces there was nothing pleasant about it. But they had done it because of love. It all centers really around love. Caring and caring for one another's welfare. And because we care and love, sometimes we must confront And sometimes we must be confronted. Doctors who care about us confront us about our unhealthy habits. Sometimes they have to tell us unpleasant news. If if I didn't think my doctor cared about me, I'd get a different doctor. Policemen sometimes have to confront us about dangerous activity. And I believe with all of my heart the vast majority of our police officers do it because they care about us. It's 
not because of the big bucks. Coaches confront a team that plays sloppily. Loving parents step in as a child misbehaves because that's the easiest way? No, because that's the loving way. True friends will also pull us aside at times for our own good. But we need to understand that godly confrontation is love in its fullest action. That being true, that being true, then why is it so hard? for us to move. Why is it so hard for us to confront one another about sin? I think it is one of the hardest things for most of us to do. And it's not because we don't understand sin. We don't, it's not because we don't understand what is right and wrong. But boy, is it hard for most of us to do. <laughs> One of the reasons, I think, is that far, far too often, life supersedes love. Our desire to be liked by the individual is more powerful than our willingness to love the individual. And therefore, we set aside difficult tasks for fear that we won't be liked anymore. And being liked is more important sometimes to us than loving. We're more concerned with feelings than souls. We're more concerned with family harmony than eternal harmony. I, I love family harmony. But I want to be with my family eternally. Far more than I want to be with them for a few decades. When our desire to be liked is greater than our willingness to love, then it becomes a hard thing for us. Secondly, I think sometimes we're simply uncommitted and self-centered. And uncommitted and self-centered means we are going to take the road that is easiest for us, not necessarily the road that is best. Not taking God, His Word, and His warning seriously. Worrying about our comfort rather more than we do maybe about somebody else's salvation. I was with a congregation just a few weeks ago and they're doing some evangelistic canvassing and one of the elders came up to me and he said, I am really out of my comfort zone. And then he said, and that's good. And that's good. When we don't confront, we very likely enable. Sometimes we take family over Scripture. Sometimes we take family over Scripture. But you and I, as the family of God, have a dual responsibility. And that is, number one, to sometimes comfort the afflicted, and secondly, to sometimes afflict the comfortable. And both are quite important. So much of, of church life, pardon me, has to do with handling people correctly. Handling His Word well. Handling our brothers and sisters well. And both are very critical issues. And neither can be neglect neglected. Just because you may be skilled in the Scriptures does not give you license to be abrasive and obnoxious with people. And sometimes the most skilled in Scripture are the most obnoxious and abrasive. Just because you are good with people does not give you or me license to handle God's Word matter-of-factly. We've got to stick to the truth. <coughs> Paul in Galatians 6 1, which most of you can quote, tells us very much as brothers and sisters in the family that we are to 
with gentleness and meekness restore such a one that needs to be corrected. How easy it is to become either less gentle or less biblical. But I don't think that's an either or as Scripture presents it to me. Gentleness and meekness. Galatians 6, 1. I just referenced that. But I'd like to go to a couple of other passages, and if you have your Bibles, maybe this would be the one time today I would ask you to maybe be worth turning. Because they're not necessarily passages that I have always associated with this subject, but I think they have great bearing. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Rebuke not an elder. Now, that's been discussed whether that's the office of the elder or whether it's an elder person chronologically. It really doesn't matter to me right now, which it is. But it says, Rebuke not an elder, but notice, but entreat him as a father. Some translations render that exhort him. Entreat carries the concept of gentleness. Calling near. It's interesting, that word entreat is parakaleo. And if you recall what the word for the Holy Spirit, the comforter that comes alongside, he's saying, come alongside. There's a gentleness. There's a putting the arm around. It's not a wagging finger. And it's a principle that at least I think we see repeated in word and example throughout Scripture. If you would care to, we can look at 2 Timothy, and I'm going to, chapter 4. There, one of the instructions that Paul gives to Timothy, an evangelist, is, in second, verse 2 of chapter 4, preach the word, okay, be instant in season and out of season, okay, now we get to the three words for our lesson. Reprove, rebuke, but notice what he follows those two words up with. Exhort. Now what does exhort mean? Exhort means in its base form is to build up. When we're to exhort one another, we're to build up one another. Now notice what we have, I believe, going on in that passage. We have the admonition, yes, to reprove, reprove and to rebuke, but to do it with exhorting and long-suffering, patience. Rebuke, yes, but build up, comfort, re entreat with gentleness and love, always. How do you build up in a rebuke? How do you chastise someone and build them up? Well, there's multiple ways to do that, but one of my favorite examples, and I'm not going to take the time to turn back to it, but in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, that's where Nathan has just come to King David and rebuked him about his conduct. And David has just said, I have sinned. And then Nathan says in that verse 13 that the Lord accepts your repentance. That's a paraphrase. But then he says in the last part of verse 13, Thou shall not die. Now why did Nathan say that? Well, I suspect rolling around in David's mind was, am I going to be like Achan? Am I going to be like some of the other people that God just had the earth swallow them up? No. Nathan left David with hope. God's forgiving you and you're not going to die. You're going to go on. But yes, there were consequences for David's actions. In chapter 2 of this passage in a book in 2 Timothy, while we're here, let me look at verse 24, 5, and 6. 2 Timothy 2. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but, he, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patience, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. They're just shooting themselves in the foot, would be my translation. 
if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him. That's a call to reprove. It's a call to calling people back. But he says to do it with meekness. Always with love. I think there is some difference between reproof and rebuke. There's a lot of overlap, but I believe there is some difference. The concept of reprove or reprove, reprove comes from the Greek word elegio, and it means to convince and tell a fault. Now, if I hand you maybe an essay that I've written, I would say, Daryl, would you please proofread this? He would proofread it, and he'd have to make some red marks because there would be errors. And he would hand it back to me, and I would say, thank you, because I am asking him to point out my error. That's the attitude that often I think that companies are reproof. A rebuke is a little stronger. It's a harsh reprimand or a stern admonition. In the first case, I'm... I'm soliciting correction. In the second case, I'm not soliciting correction. You may have to correct me, but it's not because I'm saying correct me. There's a willful turning away that requires a sterner correction. And just for instance, a couple of examples in the New Testament. Peter, when the cock crew, after he had denied Christ, how did he respond? Apollos, when it was pointed out to him in Acts that he wasn't teaching the full doctrine, we get the attitude from him that, thank you for teaching me. Thank you for correcting me. You contrast that with Hamanias and Alexander, who, Scripture said, they were commanded to turn them over to Satan in 1 Timothy chapter 1. When we correct, we need to follow the basic rules of good manners and gentleness. Hopefully, we can correct behind closed doors, privately. Hopefully, we can do it tactfully and with grace. Sometimes within the church body, sometimes within our families, we don't do it that way. You and I both know that. But that's God's way of trying to bring us to repentance. Now, that does not mean there is ultimately sometimes not the need for stern and decisive action. But you and I have only become successful in correcting someone when they have become convinced of their own in their own minds and are now going to do what is right. That's repentance. Not doing it because it'll get me off their back or you off their back. It's because they see in their minds. And gentleness seems to be a key in this process. Now that does not mean tolerance of sin, but gentleness and restoration. There are some who simply stir the pot rather than restore the fallen. And that's to our shame when that occurs. Always love when you reprove. Reproof without love is not a godly approach. But also be thankful when you are reproved and somebody loves you enough to do it. Because it is not easy. Just think how hard it is for you to talk to somebody else about a problem. Well, it's that hard for them to talk to you. They may or may not be right, but thank them for caring enough to bring it to your attention so that at least you can consider it. Nothing is worth having unrepentant sins in our lives because the stakes are catastrophic, aren't they? Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set on them to do evil. 
When sin is not corrected, it just encourages others to fall right in because our tendency is to say, nothing bad happened to them, so it must be okay, or at least I can get away with it. That's exactly the way we think. A couple of other passages from Proverbs. Blows that hurt, cleanse away the evil. As do stripes the inner depths of the heart. Sometimes chastening is that. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. But always do it with love. Speaking the truth in love so that we may grow up in all things into Him, which is the head. Am I my brother's keeper? One of the very early questions in the Bible. Probably question number two. Well, in one sense, I'm not, because we each make our own decisions. But you and I are each other's keepers in that we have a responsibility to not only correct when we can, but to accept correction. We tend to think of this subject as, how are we going to correct other people? Also think of this subject as, how am I going to be more correctable? Discipline comes in a multiplicity from a multiplicity of sources. Sometimes it comes directly from God. Proverbs 6.23, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is a light, and reproof and instruction are the way of life. You're reading scriptures, and it convicts you. Be wise enough to let it convict you. Because that's what it's there for. Sometimes correction comes from our families. Nothing's more delightful than for a parent to see their child responding appropriately to correction. Probably nothing is more delightful for God than when He sees us responding appropriately. Sometimes a little child will look at their dad and say, Dad, you're just gone all the time. You know what that is? That could be a reproof. Dad, you're not doing your job. You're not there for me. Now, I don't know that that's always what that means, but we need to give that consideration. Sometimes it comes from others. Parents can teach their children greatly through reproves. We tell them to make their bed. It doesn't happen all the time, does it? It's an appropriate time for reproof. It's an appropriate time for learning. Sometimes our employers can reprove us. Your work's slipping. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but that's a time to stop and think. Because as Christians, we work under the Lord and we don't want our work to slip. Because it reflects on Christianity. It reflects on our Lord. Sometimes reproofs come individuals from brothers and sisters in the church. Matthew chapter 18. Sometimes it has to come from the church corporate, from the entire body. That's kind of the last resort, but at times that has to happen. Why do we resist accepting correction? Well, let me give you just a few thoughts on that. Most of us are stubborn. And we don't want to be told that we're wrong. That's just the way we are. I'm that way. You're that way. If you want me to think how smart you are, tell me how great I am. Now I again say that with tongue in cheek, but that is our tendency, isn't it? 
Sometimes we just get callous. Part of what the Scripture calls a hard heart. Reproofs come and we're callous and we don't even recognize them. We're preoccupied. We miss vital disciplines. We're oblivious to the issues that really we need to address. We have our heads in the sand at some time. Scripture calls that dull of hearing. Hebrews 5.11 says, Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing we are dull of hearing. I recently did a survey, a mental survey, for another study on 1 Corinthians. And there's probably more than this, but I went through 1 Corinthians, and at least ten times in 1 Corinthians, Paul reproves the brothers and sisters at Corinth. Now, if I came here and gave a sermon and listed ten things that are wrong with this congregation, that could well be the last time I'm here. I'm not saying that, but he really laid it out at me. You know an interesting thing? In the very first part of 2 Corinthians, after he had reproved them at least ten or twelve times, he calls them saints. What does that tell you? I think that tells me that they accepted his reproofs and worked on them so that he could still call them saints when he wrote the second letter. I think those people were probably willing to work on their issues. Sometimes it's apathy. We just don't care anymore. Sometimes we get very defensive. What do you mean? Well, they're worse than I am. They may or may not be, but that's irrelevant, isn't it? That is irrelevant. Why do you and I resist giving correction? Well, I don't know all of the answers, of course, but I think sometimes we're timid. We lack confidence. We have fear. And this may tie into wanting to be liked more than to show our love. And we start thinking in these terms. Maybe time will fix it, so I don't need to do anything. Or if I wait long enough, someone else more qualified than I is going to step in. Or I don't want to be thought of as a busybody. We rehearse the mode in our own eye versus the speck in their eye. And all of those have some validity to it, but oftentimes I think those are absolute excuses for not doing what the Scriptures tell us to do. Maybe there is somebody else more qualified to do it, but if they're not doing it, it falls to you. It falls to me. I hope you love me enough. You love my soul more than you care about my feelings. Now, do it with love. Sometimes I think it's a fear of being overly bold. We don't want to be the bull in the china shop. And again, we need to do this with love and gentleness and meekness. But that is not synonymous with not doing it and sweeping it under the rug. Paul, in his little book in Philemon, he could have boldly ordered Onesimus to be taken back. He could have swept it under the rug and said, you go back and work it out yourself. I've got other more important things to do. But he didn't do either, did he? Sometimes it's an issue of indifference. Maybe we just don't care. Maybe we don't love enough. Maybe we don't love, period. I don't know. I can't read the mind. Each one of us sometimes in this walk have to make a decision between happiness and holiness. Some people say, I just want to be happy. I don't think that's God's wish for any of us. God's wish for you and I and all of the people sitting around you is that we be holy. Now maybe you can be holy and happy 
But there are times when we have to make a choice. Always take holiness over happiness. It does not matter the blood that throws, flows through your veins. And please take this next two sentences with all the love I can muster. It does not matter whether you are a lead or a Sparks or a Morris or a Brady or an Engel or a Herman. That doesn't matter one single iota. What does matter is what spirit guides your life. What matters is what spirit guides our lives. Not all the leaves are going to make it to heaven. Not all the Morrises are probably going to make it to heaven. Not all the Bradys are going to make it to heaven. Not all the Ingles are going to make it to heaven. Not all the Hermans are going to make it to heaven. I'm not talking about those present. But, but all those who are guided by the Spirit of God are going to make it. And that's what counts. So let's be one another people. Let's love one another enough to correct each other when we need it. And let's be thankful one to another when people love us enough to tell us what we need to hear as opposed to what we maybe want to hear. Is there somebody that you need to talk to? Is there somebody that you love enough to take one of the most daring steps that you will ever take? And that's talk to them about their soul. By this shall all men know that they are my disciples if you have love one for another. But there is absolutely no excuse for unloving correction. Neither is there any excuse for the absence of loving correction. I talked last night about chess and monopoly. In a few months, most of you won't remember my talk last night. You'll remember chess and Monopoly and trash. That's what you're going to remember. I know that. But please, let us all remember the Word of God when He says, Whom I love, I chasten. And He has laid that responsibility to some extent at each of our feet.